Jonah chapter 1. We're going to do a little bit different um, study through the book of Jonah. We're just going to look at the, the story of Jonah. Jonah's a short book um, in the, the back of the Old Testament. It's always one of those books that um, I do go to a lot, soul winning, and I have the kind of the corners of my Bible folded so I can get to them, get to it easy. It's a really short book. It's kind of hard to find in your Bible um, if you don't have a Bible that you're used to opening to the book of Jonah. It's right in between Obadiah and uh, Micah, but a really short book, short story in the Bible, but it's a real story about a real prophet um, in the northern kingdom of Israel. So we're going to not go so much chapter by chapter, but we're just going to pre, I'm going to preach through this entire story in parts. Okay, so we may have, um, you know, several parts in one chapter and maybe one part in another chapter, um, but there's several um, powerful lessons to learn um, from the story of Jonah, and I'm excited to look through that um, in the next uh, coming weeks. So who is Jonah? Go to 2 Kings um, chapter 14. 2 Kings chapter 14. The Bible does mention him um, one other place in the Bible. Um, look at 2 Kings chapter 14. So Jonah was a king, um, not, a, not a king. Jonah was a prophet in the northern kingdom of Israel during the reign of Jeroboam uh, II, I guess you could call it. Um, you know, the second um, Jeroboam in the northern kingdom of Israel. So remember the northern kingdom of Israel um, was a wicked, they had wicked king after wicked king. They had several dynasties. It wasn't just son of son of son, um, the father, son, father, son, father, son, like the lower kingdom of Judah um, to fulfill the, the messianic prophecy to um, David. But it was just constant treachery and constant evil kings. Um, Jonah was a prophet in the northern kingdom during the last you know, maybe 20 years before uh, the northern kingdom was taken into captivity, or not even taken it, I'm, that's not even the right word, carried away um, by the kingdom or the empire of Assyria, all right? And Assyria is actually where Nineveh um, resides, all right? Look at 2 Kings chapter 14, just an example here, and look at verse number 23. The Bible says, in the 15th year of Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah. So many times the Bible will explain, hey, um, it's, here's the timeline. You know, it's, it's kind of explaining who the kings are in, in reference to who the king of Judah is and who the king of, um, of the northern kingdom of Israel is. It says king of Judah. So Joash was king of Judah. Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, began to reign in Samaria. So, of course, Samaria was the capital of the northern kingdom of Israel. We've got the northern kingdom of Israel and the lower kingdom of Judah. Right? And he reigned 40 and 1 years, which is a long time for the northern kingdom of Israel. Many of those kings um, didn't last uh, very long at all because they were just, they were killed right away. There was a lot of treachery, a lot of evil. And he did that, was what, that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. So he was not a good king. He departed not from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. That's the first Jeroboam who set up the two golden calves. And they immediately started worshiping false gods in the northern kingdom. So he was just doing the same thing that, that, that all the other kings did, who made Israel to sin. Look at verse 25. It says, He restored the coast of Israel from entering of Hamath unto the sea of the plain, according to the word of the Lord of the God, God of Israel, which he spake by the hand of his servant Jonah, the son of Imitai, the prophet, which was of Gathepher. This is the same Jonah that we see in Jonah chapter 1. So now go back to Jonah chapter 1. So he's mentioned as a prophet of the northern kingdom of Israel. That's all I really wanted to point out there. Um, but look at Jonah chapter 1, and let's get into this story about um, God um, dealing with his prophet here. Look at verse number 1 of Jonah chapter 1. It says, Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai. So we see, we know it's the same Jonah because of that phrase right there. Jonah, the son of Amittai. Same thing we see in 2 Kings chapter 14. It says, Arise. Go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come before me. So this is interesting because Nineveh is a city, it is actually the capital city of the Assyrian Empire. So this is not a, a friendly city to, just, just keep in mind that in 20 years in the future, this Assyrian Empire is going to completely destroy the northern kingdom of Israel. And the Assyrian Empire was... Uh, if you go and you read historical, you know, accounts of the Syrian Empire, it was a quite different animal than the Babylonian Empire that overtook Judah, okay? The Assyrian Empire was very brutal. They were very, very pagan, very just, I mean, just very, very brutal people. Let's put it that way. 
So when the Syrian Empire came in and invaded the Northern Kingdom of Israel, it was a terrible situation. And this is where we get, you know, they, they brought in people and they, they took away the, the people out of there. And, and this is why, you know, people say that there's no, you know, the ten tribes were lost. Because they, they came in and they inserted their own people in there and they intermixed um, with the people that were left of the Northern Kingdom of Israel, the ones that they didn't kill or, or take away to Assyria. And then, you know, that's where we get the Samaritans. You know, the, the Jews of Jesus' time didn't even, didn't even consider the people in Samaria as uh, Jews because they were all these Assyrian, you know, they, they, they were basically racist against them, saying they, were, they didn't believe in their God anymore and they were mixed, intermixed with all these pagan people and all this stuff, right? So God is telling this guy, God is telling his prophet to go to this foreign city and preach unto these people against, you know, against their wickedness that they're doing. And, you know, Jonah, he's not excited about that. You know, he's not excited about that because look at what he does. It says, Jonah rose up. So when you look at where the city of Nineveh is, it's basically to the northeast, north, yeah, northeast of where Jonah would be residing. And he's saying, go to Nineveh. And in verse number three, it says, Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa. Remember, down, he's going down to the coast. So he's going down in elevation to the coast, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So he goes southwest. He's supposed to go northeast. So he literally runs away from the situation and runs away from God telling him to go and do this thing that God told him. The word of the Lord came to him, and he ran the other way. All right, look at verse number four. It said, But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken, meaning the ship was being tossed around. Here we have another, you know, um, terrible ship situation. And the mariners were afraid, and they cried every man to his God, and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down in the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. The shipmaster came to him and said, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God, if it be so that God will think upon us that we perish not. And they say every one to his fellow, Come and let us cast lots, that we, they may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Jonah. And they say, What's this all about, casting lots? Well, casting lots is actually something that was used even by the priests to have God make a decision. So it's not like they're gambling here. You know, they're not throwing dice, all right? They're not gambling for money. They're casting lots, and God used this to communicate with them. They're basically, what is casting lots? It's like drawing straws, right? It's basically they're letting God, they're letting randomness, or, you know, in this case, God make this decision on who the, the person that's bad is. And they said unto him, tell us, and they, it fell upon Jonah. Jonah pulled the short straw, and they're like, aha, he's the problem, all right? And he said unto them, and they, they said to him, Tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil is upon us? What is thine occupation, and whence comest thou? Why, what is thy country, and what, of what people art thou? And he said unto them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which hath made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid, and said unto him, Why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them. So these men... Uh, on this ship, they weren't, they, they believed in all these different other gods and all these things, but they believed the story that Jonah told them, and Jonah explained the entire story to them that God told them to do this thing and that he didn't do this thing. And they're like, well, if he's the God of the land and the sea and he's the God of heaven, why wouldn't you have listened to him? Is what they're saying, because now look at us. Now look at this situation that we're in. He explained it to them. Then they said unto him, What shall we do unto thee, that the sea may be calm unto us? For the sea wrought and was tempestuous. And he said to them, Take me up and cast me forth into the sea. So the sea shall be calm unto you, for I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. So Jonah, he doesn't argue with them. He doesn't argue with the, he explains what he, Jonah knows why this is happening. He knows why God is upset at him. And he's like, just throw me in the sea. He's, he's guilty, and, and God, will, you know, this, God will not destroy you because he's trying to get to me. But nevertheless, this is interesting here. 
The man, so he, I mean, the prophet of God, the prophet of God tells them what to do. This is very similar to Paul telling the, the, the men in Acts chapter 26, 27 what to do, and they listen to him. Jonah literally tells them what to do, but instead they don't do what Jonah wants to do, and they try to come up with their own way to get themselves out of this. Granted, you can say, well, they had a good reason. They didn't want to just kill this person, and it says that's what their reason was. It says, let us not perish um, for this man's life and lay not upon us innocent blood. So they didn't want to do what the prophet said. They had their own reasons. They thought that, you know, but Jonah wasn't innocent. He was guilty of what God was doing to them, and he told them how to solve it, and instead they try to just work their way. They try to get themselves out of it. We'll talk about that a little bit later, all right? But anyway, it didn't work. It didn't work. So they finally, verse 15, like they know how to solve the problem he told them. They finally realized they can't solve it themselves. So then they took up Jonah, cast him forth into the sea. And then the sea seized from her raging. And then the men feared the Lord exceedingly. And they're like, okay, he was right. You know, everything that he said was true, even though, you know, they weren't Christians. They didn't believe in the God of the Bible. They had their own gods, it said. But they believed him at that point. All right, now we're going to stop right there. And we're just going to look at this first part of the story where Jonah gets a clear direction from God. The prophet gets a clear direction from God. The prophet says, no, I don't want to. And he goes his own way, and God just chastises him and puts him into this terrible storm that looks like it's going to cost him and many other people their lives. Okay, now we know, um, if you heard the story, we know, and we're going to look at the rest of the story um, in coming weeks, um, we know that God did not kill Jonah, that God was just trying to bring Jonah back into where God wanted him in the first place. But the point is that God called Jonah, and Jonah didn't listen. It was very clear. And you say, well, how could this apply to us? You know, how could this apply to me? You say, this guy... This guy's a prophet. You know, this guy's a prophet in the Old Testament. He's a prophet in the Bible. I mean, this is, you know, this does not apply to me at all. Well, I'm going to show you tonight that this does apply to you and that God does call you. God does call you in many different ways. And if we don't pick up the phone, the results in our lives will be similar to what Jonah is dealing with here. You say, how, how does God call me? I'm not a prophet. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2. I could go on for hours and hours on how God calls you in your life. I'll just give you some major milestones that God calls people. All right? So I'm going to give you some milestones that God calls you in your life. All right? Look, and this is also going to, just by way of, of looking at the Bible, this is also going to disprove Calvinism that God you know, created certain people to be saved, and he created certain people to be damned. I mean, that's just going to be a result of, of something that you see from the sermon tonight, even though that's not the point of the sermon. So the question is, how does God call me? How does God call you in 2023 as Bible-believing Christians? Well, first of all, if you're here tonight and you've believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, if you're saved, God has called you. God has called you, and you have answered that call. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 2. You say, well, God called me? God called me? Well, first of all, when you got saved and, and you look back at your salvation, don't you feel like that you answered a call when, when you got saved? I think this is like how people kind of misinterpret this, and maybe some people that are even saved fall into this idea that God only calls certain people. But look what the Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 3. The Bible says that God, he's making this phone call to everybody. God is calling everyone to be saved. I mean, he's, he's calling, it's just not everybody's answering. It says, for this is good and acceptable, verse 3, in the sight of God our Savior. Look what it says in verse 4. It says, who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. That means that it is God's will for all men to be saved. Turn to Romans chapter 1. Turn to Romans chapter 1. In John 3.16, in John 3.16, the Bible says, whosoever. That means anybody. 
You know, whosoever shall believe in him. I mean, the Bible, it, it says anybody that does this. And if you combine that with 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 2, it's literally saying that God, it's, it's God's desire, it's God's will that everyone would trust on Jesus. It, it's very simple. It, look, it's not God's fault that everyone is not going to trust in Jesus. Okay, look at Romans chapter 1. Look at Romans chapter 1. You say, how does God call people to salvation? How does God call people that don't have the Bible, that don't have, you know, um, all the advantages of someone that was just raised in a Christian home, all these things? How does God call those people? Well, God explains to us how he calls everyone. He explains the two things that everybody gets. This is the answer to the, you know, the, the, the proverbial question or the metaphorical question about what about the kid in the Amazon forest or whatever, right? That's never even heard of Jesus, right? This is what people will say. Well, every single person, including the kid in the Amazon forest or wherever else, has these two things. Look at verse number 20 of Romans chapter 1. The Bible says, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are what? They're without excuse. That's saying that everybody can look around and they can see how powerful God is through the creation that he's put in front of them, especially the person living in the, the rainforest or whatever. I mean, you can look around, you can see the creation, you can see what when we look out into the heavens, as the psalmist said, we look into the heavens and we see the stars and we see the universes, and we see the galaxies, and what does that show us? What does that show us with our, with our heart that we have, our conscience that we have, that shows us the power on the eternal Godhead. It, it, showed, it shows us the power and the, the eternity and the, the, just the everlasting nature of God. Is, is what that shows us. All right, look at verse number um, 14 of Romans chapter 2. Here's the other thing that everybody starts with. You say, how does God call everybody? Well, he gives everybody um, the evidence of his eternal power around them. Look at verse 14. It says, for when the Gentiles, these are the people that, th this is what it's talking about. The people that were not Jews, the people that were not of the nation of Israel, the people that didn't have the Bible, they didn't have the oracles of God. It's like, how, how did they? How did they know that, that there was a one true God? When the Gentiles, which have not the law, they don't have the Bible, do by nature the things contained in the law, these not having the law, are a law unto themselves, which show, it's saying these, these people, the, the, they didn't have the Bible, and they're going out and they're knowing that stealing's wrong. They're knowing that murder is wrong. They're knowing that if you go and you look at just pagan societies that they will, you know, I mean, many of them have just gone to the, the, you know, the devil. But I mean, basically any person when they're born, they know, they grow up and they know that these things are wrong. These things have to be undone. These things have to be changed in their conscience. They start with this in their heart. Look at verse 15. It says, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness and their thoughts the mean while accusing or else excusing one another it says that everybody starts with that everybody starts with that law written in their hearts now look you can sear that you can get into all kinds of sin and you can get into all kinds of wickedness and you can scar and you can sear your conscience but everybody starts with it and if you choose in your life to go into a bunch of sin and a bunch of wickedness in your life. Yeah, it's possible that somebody that lives a wicked life that has scarred their conscience to the point of, you know, not having this conscience anymore, not having this pure conscience, that when somebody comes up to them and wants to give them the gospel, that they will have no interest at all. But that does not mean God did not choose that person, that God did not call that person. It means that that person did not protect that perfect, pure heart that God gave them. Just like we talked about children a couple weeks ago. You know, children have that pure heart. Children have that desire, that desire to seek the Lord. That's why you see that. That's why you go out soul winning and you go out and you see kids come to church and they just love it here. But it's their parents many times with the scarred conscience, and the, the, the wickedness that they're into that are like, no, we're not going to church. Please, 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 please take us to church. 
But it's the scarred conscience of the older people that will stop that. But that's why God, that's why Jesus said, you know, as such are the kingdom of heaven. Talking about that purity of children. He's talking about Romans chapter 2, verse 14 and verse 15. That, that perfect law written in their heart. Look, you can break that. You can, you can wreck that. And you do that through sin. But it doesn't mean God didn't call. It means that, you know, for you know, someone that doesn't get saved or doesn't accept the gospel, it means that they've damaged what God gave them. And they've done it through, it, it's always the same every time, it's through sin in your life. All right, so that's the first call right there. But we've all answered that call, hopefully. Everyone's saved tonight, so we've all answered that phone call. You say, what other phone calls are there? Well, how about this one? Just the, the, the call to get to church. The call to, you know, get into a Bible-believing church. The Bible says in Hebrews 10, 25, to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is. So the Bible tells us, hey, get into church. That's the Bible telling you. That's, the, that's God calling you to get into a local assembly of believers and, you know, start learning the Bible. That's a call right there. And from, look, from that call, you're going to realize that from each of these calls, many other calls come. You're going to start to realize there's many other calls in your life. Once you do get into church, once you do get plugged in, once you do start realizing what the Bible has to say, you're going to start realizing, oh man, there's a lot of things that I should be doing. There's a lot of things that I'm called not to do. But church is, is, the, is the beginning of that. That's why it's so important when somebody gets saved that they just get, they just get plugged into a church. They get plugged in. It may not even feel right at first that they've never been to church before. But they get saved. They need to get plugged in so they can know what God wants for them in their life. I've never had anyone tell me, soul winning, after they got saved, I've never had anyone tell me that, you know, they want to waste their life that they don't want to do anything with their life, they just want to, you know, they just want to take this one life that they have and just, just have it be worthless. But you're going to see tonight that that's exactly what a lot of Christians do, is they just live a completely worthless life. So look, church, and attending a local church that is preaching the actual Bible, it's a call, it's a phone call that, that you, are, you are called to pick up. Turn to Acts chapter 8. Here's another one. After you get saved, baptism. That's a call. That's what, you know, that's when you start learning things about the Bible. You start learning, what does God want from me now? Now I'm saved. God gave me this gift of everlasting life. What does he want from me on this earth? Baptism is like the first one. Look at verse number 36 of Acts chapter 8. Paul or, uh, uh, Philip preaches the gospel to this eunuch, and as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said... He's gotten saved. He says, here's water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. He's like, if you're saved, is what he's saying there. Because what, what does believing with all your heart do? It, 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 that's how you get saved. And he says, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot. Verse 37 is missing from every modern Bible, by the way. Imagine that. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized them. So the eunuch answered that phone call. All right, that's where, it, you know, Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, where Peter says, you know, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. He's saying, repent and be baptized, but he's saying, repent means, like, turn from unbelief to belief. So that one word is saying, get saved. And then literally, Peter is including baptism is like the first thing that you should do. He's like, get saved and get baptized. So look, that's answering a call. So you're being called. You're being called for that. That's what you have to understand. How about this one? Turn to Psalm chapter 119. If you open your Bible right in the middle, you'll more than likely fall in the book of Psalms. Psalm chapter 119 is the longest book in the Bible, and it is almost completely about just reading and learning the Word of God and loving the Word of God. Look at Psalm chapter 119. It's all about God's word. Here's another thing that you're called to do. Look at Psalm chapter 119, verse 18. Psalm chapter 119, verse number 18. Psalm 119, verse number 18. We're talking about what is God calling me to do? Yes, he called the prophet Jonah. 
to go to Nineveh and preach a very specific message against this city, but what's he calling me to do? Look what he's calling you to do in verse number 18. Open thou mine eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. So here's a call to read your Bible. Here's a call to read the Word of God. Look, don't just come and just listen. Look, come and listen to preaching, but go home and read your Bible. Go home and, and have a Bible reading time in your life and read a, a chapter or a few every single day. Look, if you're saved, you need to read your Bible cover to cover one time as soon as you possibly can. You should set a goal. If, you, if you're recently saved and you've never, or if you've just never done that, you should do that this year. It is easy to do in one year. I mean, you can read the Bible four times in a year. That's kind of uh, aggressive. You've got to kind of read an hour and a half a day or so. But to read your Bible cover to cover in one year is not that hard to do. There's schedules to do it. If you want a schedule, I'll give you a schedule to read your Bible cover to cover in one year. And you know what's going to happen? You're going to see wondrous things out of thy law. And you know what those wondrous things are going to, going to open up to you? More calls. <laughs> it's going to open up things to you in your life like, Oh, man, God wants me to do this. Oh, I should be doing this. Oh, I shouldn't be doing this. And it's just going to, every single time you read through your Bible, you will find more wondrous things. You, I don't care how many times you read the Bible. You will just keep finding wondrous things in the Bible, which are basically more calls from God. Because, look, this is what God wants for us. This is what God wants us to do. This is the phone call right here. And these wondrous things will just keep coming out to you. I mean, the Bible is not going to read itself. I mean, you can't just sleep on your Bible and then just get better at, you know, knowing what the wondrous things in the Bible are. You actually have to read it. All right? So listening to preaching is great, but you should be reading the Bible every single day, and it will, it will show you what God wants. How about this one? Turn to Mark chapter... Actually, you turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm just giving you some milestone calls. All right? I'm just giving you some examples of, yeah, God's calling you. God's calling you for things in your life. In Mark 16, 15, you know, it's a very famous verse in the Bible. You know, Jesus says, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Very famous verse in the Bible. Very easy to understand. He's telling the disciples. You're going to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He's telling the, the disciples, he's like, hey, go out and preach the gospel. Now, that's your job. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 18. The Bible says that all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Now, that's interesting. He says it again in verse 19. He says, to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. So Jesus Christ did the reconciling, meaning he made it right. He's the one that reconciled the world to God. All right? He's the one that paid the price. He, he did the reconciling. He, he, made, he gave the proper payment for the sin debt of the entire world. But that ministry, what, is the, what do you mean the ministry? Telling people how to connect with that gift is up to us. You know, that ministry of reconciliation, telling people about that and how to receive that free gift and about that reconciliation that has actually happened, that's on you. That's on everyone that is saved. That's literally like the, the first work, the first real ministry that every saved believer is to have. And this is the, the one that nobody's doing today. This is the one that you'll find, you know, churches out there that maybe they have the right gospel, but they're not doing this. You know, they're not going to go out and they're not going to preach the gospel to people. Because it's that word of reconciliation. Look at those last three words of verse 19. It says, he committed unto us the word of reconciliation. You know what the word of reconciliation is? It's the gospel. That's what we're doing. We go out today and we find somebody that, that wants to know how to get to heaven. We preach to them the word of reconciliation. We preach the gospel. There's all kinds of calls, folks. There's all kinds of, you know, just growth 
in the Christian life, and these are all calls that God is making to you through His Word. And, you know, here's the thing about Christians that, that most Christians, many Christians, will never really know their true potential that God had for them on this earth. God knows what your true potential is because God knows every single individual who's saved. He knows what they can do if they just listen to the calls that he's giving them. But this is how you know, folks. You answer one call, and then you hear the next call. Another comes in, you answer that one, and then just more and more open themselves up to you. Look, you don't know. You don't know everything when you get saved. I mean, you don't get saved. You know, if somebody doesn't give you the gospel, and all of a sudden you know everything God wants for you in your life. That's not how that works. You know, you don't just get saved and be like, I know the Bible perfectly now, and I want to start my own church next week. I mean, you don't, that's just not how it works. What you do is you, you, you receive that call of salvation, you trust on Jesus, you start diving into his word, getting into church, getting baptized, listening to what God says, just, and just picking up the phone. Just picking up the phone. God wants me to do this, and you just do it, and you just do it, and you just do it. But the problem is, is that people hit obstacles. People hit obstacles on every single call in their life. And look, you'll, I, I don't know, I, I just see this all the time. People hit obstacles with church. Church is a big one. Church is a big one because people aren't used to coming to church, and that's a different thing. But you know what? You're supposed to become a different creature. You're born again spiritually. Now you just have to take that spirit that's inside you and change your flesh. You actually have to listen to that spirit and actually do what it says and quit listening to your flesh. Because you know what? At every single one of these milestones, that's where the devil's going to attack you. The devil's going to attack you when you want to get plugged into church. The devil's going to attack you when you want to get baptized. The devil's going to really attack you. And I warn people about this one specifically. When you start, when you decide, I'm going to become a soul winner, the devil's going to hit you. I guarantee it. It happens every time. You know, how's the devil going to attack you? He's going to put all kinds of doubts in you. What am I, what am I doing this for? Are you kidding me? I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to go out and I'm going to walk down the street with a Bible? I mean, the devil, will, the devil will do that to you. The devil will put those doubts in you. It, all other churches aren't doing this. Why, why is this guy telling me this is what we should be doing? I'm not telling you. The Bible's telling you. I'm telling you what the Bible says. I'm just kind of like, like a phone repeater. I'm just repeating the calls to you. But soul winning is a huge one. Then you become a, you know, I'm going to start going out and I'm going to start learning soul winning. I tell people, your life is going to change. Your life is going to change. You now have a target on your back. Because now you are a serious threat. Look, coming to church, learning the Bible, that's all great things. You start going out soul winning. You start learning how to give the gospel. You're threatening Satan. You are threatening the, the God of this world with defeat. Because every single person that we go out and we preach the gospel to and we pass from death to life, he loses. And when you start, then you start becoming a, a, someone who's actually giving the gospel. Satan's going to do everything he possibly can to stop you in those cases. He's going to throw things in your life to try to, to try to knock you back into things you were into. He's going to throw people in your life that are going to try to pull you out of this. He's going to send people to you. These are all things that I've actually literally seen over and over and over again. He's going to send people to you to cast doubts on you. What are you doing that for? That's weird. That doesn't seem like something that people do. You're going to have all kinds of, of attacks come on you, especially once you start soul winning. But it, it's, it's, it's going to happen. So you just have to make that decision to just keep pushing, keep answering that call. Be prepared. Be determined to pick up the phone and just listen. You say, well, you know, what if I miss the phone calls? You know, what if I miss the calls? You know, Jonah, Jonah didn't really, Jonah didn't really miss the call. Jonah got the call and he didn't listen to the call. That's, that's an extra bad one. And we're going to talk about that in a few minutes. But just, just think this, like, say like, 
Maybe you got saved later in life. I got saved later in life. Maybe you got saved later in life and, and you're like, you know what, there was a lot of calls in my life that I missed. There was a lot of things that I didn't answer in my life. But look, here's the thing. If you don't answer, God will chastise. If you're saved and you don't answer the calls that God gives you, God will chastise you. Turn to Luke um, chapter 47. Turn to Luke chapter 47. Luke chapter 47. I'm sorry, Luke chapter 12, verse number 47. <clears throat> Luke chapter 12 and verse number 47. So look, if you don't answer the call, God will chastise. If you do answer the call, Satan will attack. You're like, oh man, this doesn't sound good. Look at Luke chapter 12. Now look at verse number 47. See, it's worse if you're Jonah, though. It's worse if you know that God's calling. So, you know, that I hate, you know, if there's a downside of this church, <laughs> this isn't a downside. But if there's, you know, if there's a downside of being a, a, a growing Christian, it's that you're going to know. You're going to know because the Bible's being preached, and you're going to know what those calls are. So you're not going to be somebody that can say, I just didn't know. Because I'm going to tell you. Look at verse number 47. It says, And that servant which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. This is Jonah. This is Jonah, and this is you. If you know what you're supposed to do, but you just say, no, I'm going down to Joppa. No, I'm going to Tarshish. I'm running away. And look, this, this will be you. And look, I'm sorry to break it to you, but you can't become unsaved. You can't get out of this. This could be you for the rest of your life. Just being chastised by God because you won't pick up the phone. But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall much be required. You see that? So if you are given all the knowledge of the things that you are supposed to be doing, all the, the things that you know God is calling for you as a saved believer and you do them not, you are the one that much is required of. Much is required of you. So, I mean, if you just know nothing about the Bible and you never learn anything about the Bible, at least you didn't know is what the Bible is saying. You say, man, that's not fair. That's exactly fair. God needs people to pick up the phone and answer these calls because literally there's no other way for people to get saved. There's no other way for people to hear about that ministry of reconciliation. It's super important. It's all about the kingdom of heaven, folks. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. So look, God will chastise you, especially if you do know, like Jonah knew. If you, I mean, this is, this is the story of you know, how extreme this story was, what happened to Jonah. We need to apply that to ourselves because if we know what God is calling us to do and we don't do it, we're Jonah. It's the same thing. Look at verse number 13 of 1 Corinthians chapter 10. You say, God's going to chastise me if I don't listen to what his word says. And Satan's going to attack me if I do listen. I can't win. But you can win. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10 in verse number 13. As a matter of fact, there's only one way to win. There's only one way. You're like, I'm in between a rock and a hard place. Well, not really. Look at verse 13. It says, there hath no temptation taken you but such as common to man. That means that whatever God puts in front of you, when you're picking up the phone and answering these calls and you're trying to move forward, you're hitting milestone after milestone in your Christian life. You're like, I'm going to become a soul winner. I'm going to start talking by this date. I'm going you know, to just like start learning my Bible, learning these verses, learning how to give the gospel. You know, I want to get out there. I, wanna be, I want my feet shod with the gospel of peace as soon as possible. You're going to be under attack. But the Bible says that the attacks that are going to come to you, are, it's nothing new. Satan doesn't have anything new. He doesn't have anything original. It's nothing that's not common to man, which is another reason that it's important to be in church. Because when you come into church, you're like, man, I'm pushing forward, I'm getting milestone after milestone, I'm picking up the phone to God, you know, and you come to church and you're like, but all these things just, I keep getting attacked by this and attacked by this. Well, you know what you're going to hear? You're going to hear from all your brothers and sisters, you're going to be like, yeah, that happened to me too. Yeah, the exact same thing happened to me. And you're just going to get this edification and this strength from your brothers and sisters in Christ. Because why? Because there's nothing that Satan does to you that he hasn't done to everybody else. It's just some people are successful by pushing through it, and some people aren't. You say, well, can I be successful? Let's keep reading. But God is faithful, 
who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able. So the answer is God is saying 100% for sure you can overcome it. If you don't, it's your fault. You are strong enough to do it. You, God will not allow Satan to come at you with more than you can take. Look, it, you may think at times, like, I don't know if I can take this. You can. God tells you that you can. But you can't be out in a bunch of sin and out and living, you know, you got to be doing the things that God wants you to do. you got to be in church, reading your Bible, listening to preaching, being with your brothers and sisters in Christ, getting edified. And yeah, if you're doing those things and you're separating from the things that you can and you're strengthening yourself in that way, you will make it. It's very simple. I mean, it's not rocket surgery. It's very simple. This is the only way to win. This is the only way to win the Christian life right here. Is you can't win fighting against God. How did that go for Jonah? He's like, no, I'm going to fight God. He's like, I'm not going to listen to God. I'm going to fight God. Now he's in the ocean getting swallowed up by a fish. You can't win that way. This way, God guarantees that you can win. So you say, you know, Jonah's a prophet. God's not calling me. Yes, he is. He is calling you. You say, well, I've missed so many calls. I've missed so many calls. Well, start picking up the phone. Maybe, it, it maybe, maybe, especially those people that, you know, maybe got saved later in life. Maybe you've been through some storms as a result of not picking up the phone. You know, maybe you made a mess of some things. But God is always trying to get you back on the phone, is what you need to understand. But look, turn to John chapter 15. God is trying to get you back on that phone line so you can be fruitful. But you know what? You're like, I've made such a mess of things. I, I didn't answer the phone for years. I went my own way, and I got this big, tangled ball of a mess. First of all, and this is why, you know, we, I, I, I preach the whole Bible. We want the, the kids, the next generation, you know, to, to just listen the first time. You know why? You know why we want the kids to not go through that? There's this wicked, uh, unchristian, unbiblical philosophy out there. Like, you need to just let these kids go out and sin and experience things and what, they, what people mean, when you got, they got to go out and live life. Yeah, they got to go out and experience sin. Wrong. That is evil, wicked, and has nothing to do with the Bible. Plan A is always the best. Plan A is always the best. But you know what? God always has a plan B and a plan C and a plan M and a plan S and a plan Y for you. God always has something. And yeah, you know what? Plan A is always the best, and maybe if you don't listen to the first 150,000 phone calls in your life from God, maybe there's not that many options. Maybe, you know, your options are just to get in a church and be of service in that church in your life. Be of service to someone in a ministry. Maybe you've gone and, 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 and messed up your life to a point where you could never be qualified to be a pastor. And, but maybe that's, plan D is something else for you, is to support a ministry, support a pastor. Look at John chapter 15. You know, maybe it's just to be a blessing, just to be a soul winner to a ministry. Look at John chapter 15, verse number 2. Now, John chapter 15, it, we see this great analogy. We see this great analogy here of God wanting a Christian to be fruitful. So we see someone who's not, the, the extremes, here's the spectrum. The spectrum is no fruit and fruitful. And people will take this and, and mean, it's, it's an analogy talk, comparing you to a, a branch and talking about, you know, the difference between someone who is not fruitful and someone who is fruitful. Look at verse 2. It says, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. This is, this is uh, I have written next to my Bible, um, Saul. Someone that's just, it was just, he was just a train wreck of a Christian. Just, just a complete wreck of a Christian. God literally took him off this earth. He, he took him away. He didn't take away his salvation, but he, he chast, Saul was chastised his entire Christian life. And it ended in his death. I mean, train wreck. But look at the next one. And every branch that beareth fruit. Now, this is so interesting right here. 
So we see unfruitful Christian. Look, there's a lot of unfruitful Christians, folks. The majority of Christians are unfruitful. But one that beareth fruit, look at this, he purgeth it. Like, oh, that it may bring forth more fruit. You know what the God is saying there? He's saying a, a, a Christian who decides to grow in his Christian life, God is going to continually prune you, is what the Bible is saying. It's like he's going he's gonna to come after you and he's going he's gonna to follow you and he's going he's gonna to make sure that you don't, you know, you got a, a branch that's coming off that's going off into sin. He's going he's gonna to chastise you. Why? To get you back into that ideal fruitful state. He wants you to bear more fruit. So the Bible is saying here is that, you know, he's going to keep calling you and calling you and calling you and calling you and chastising you when you need it just to make you, why? More fruitful. Look at verse, uh, it says, now you're clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. How's he going to do that? Through the Bible, through you reading the Bible, through you coming to church, listening to preaching. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. Abide in me. Who's that? Jesus. The word. The word become flesh. Abide in the word of God. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him. The same what? It's not talking about salvation. The same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. Can we get anybody saved without the word of God? Nope. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. And people will be like, see, you go to hell. It's like, no, it's an analogy You're talking about sticks. It's talking about branches, sticks. Talking about a stick, a Christian that is not abiding in God, that is not listening to the word, that is not doing anything, that is not bearing fruit, is worthless. What do you do with a worthless branch? You burn it. That's what it's talking about. If ye abide in me and my, word abide, my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. I mean, that's a pretty good benefit right there of being a fruitful Christian. He's literally saying, I'm going to listen to your prayers. He's literally saying, I'm going to help you in your prayers. Verse 8, herein is my Father glorified, that what? That ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so I have loved you, Continue ye in my love. That's, if ye love me, keep my commandments. If ye love me, pick up the phone. Pruning you, calling you, correcting you, telling you what to do, correcting you again. All we have to do is just keep going in this, this methodology that God's telling us about. He's warning us. He's telling us, you know, here's what you're supposed to be doing. But here's the worst thing, folks. Here's the worst thing that a Christian could do. The worst thing that a Christian could do is letting past sins define their future. Letting past missed calls, past, well, I didn't listen to God here in my life, and I made a mess of some things, and I got this big tangled ball, and I'm going to let this, you know, these past sins define my future. And I'm going to let these past sins justify future sins. I mean, it's, it's crazy. It's crazy. You know, turn to Matthew chapter 18. Somebody asked me one time, and I actually used this example, and this example was, was used um, by my son today out soul winning, but I use this example all the time soul winning. I say, I, I, I say, you know, when I'm explaining eternal security, I say, well, and I'm explaining really what I'm explaining is Hebrews 12, 6, where, you know, you know whom God loveth, he chasteneth. He chasteneth every son. And, you know, if we're not, you know, how can you just say that all you have to do is trust on Jesus? Because once you become a son, once you become adopted into God's family, he's going to chasten his children. He's going to punish you on this earth. So you explain that chastening. And I always say this when I'm out soul winning. I'm saying, I always say, you know, how like, you know, God will never let us out of his hand, but he'll chasten us. I always say, well, if my son grew up to be a wicked adult, you know, and I never, I never, you know, Really, it always kind of like makes me cringe to say it. But say my son, you know, he's always standing next to me, grew up to be a wicked adult, and I kicked him out of my house. And then I always ask the question, would he, would he still be my son? And I've never had anyone say, no, he would not be your son anymore. But the point is, I've actually had somebody ask me that question 
Like, well, what if you're, what if one of your kids turned out to be a wicked person or, or whatever? And, you know, I remember when I was asked this question by somebody and, like, it, I was offended. I mean, I was a little, I mean, you know, you just, even the thought of that is, is offensive. But family and, you know, family that goes the wrong way and whether that's your fault. I mean, because, look, if, if one of my children, God forbid, would ever go off and I would have some fault in that. You know, that would be, you know, because I, you know, something happened. But there, it, there does become a point, folks, where the victim becomes the perpetrator. You know, where, where children become adults and they, they grow up and they make their own decisions and they become the perpetrator. But the thing that you need to understand is that family, especially, you know, children, they're not given some special status over God. They are not given some special status to where they can now destroy my spiritual life. And that's what you need to understand, that nothing should stop these phone calls. Past mistakes that we've all made should never stop our spiritual life going forward. Should never stop. If I miss some calls in the past, doesn't mean I should stop making or stop picking up the phone in the future. But again and again and again, you know, that parent that maybe messed up, you know, with their children and didn't do things the way God wanted, because look, God's way will work. A hundred percent. If if it if it doesn't work, it's because we didn't do it right. I mean, I've seen parents literally sacrifice other children for certain children. Sacrifice the spiritual lives of their more spiritual children for a, a child that's not spiritual at all, that's into sin and, and wickedness. This, here's the thing you have to understand. All of this in Matthew 18, when, you know, you are to just, when you confront someone and you talk to them, I mean, you go and you talk to a child that's maybe not doing the right thing, who's an adult now or whatever that is, and, and they will not receive that. You know, they're saved, but they're just not receiving, you know, the correction. Look, they need to be treated as, the, as, as a heathen man and a publican, as the Bible says. I mean, that's hard to hear. But they cannot derail your Christian life. That is not the right answer. You have to think, like, what about your other children? And especially in, this, in the case of a saved person who's a soul winner and then, you know, is just going to, like, chase around some wicked child and go and bail them out everywhere or whatever it is and derail their own spiritual life for this situation, here's the thing. We're not to step in front of God's blows. People are to be chastised by God, and we're not to step in front of that and try to lighten God's chastisement. Sometimes even people in our own families will need chastisement. And we need to be prepared to not allow that to affect our spiritual lives. Because guess what, folks? I mean, a soul winner, a soul winner leaves a soul winning church, people are going to go to hell because of that. People are not going to get saved because of that soul winner being knocked out of the Christian life. I mean, it requires, I mean, a rule of thumb is this. If it requires a sacrifice of your spiritual life, it is not of God. That's just a rule of thumb, period. And especially for soul winners, look, soul winners, and I'll, I'll say this again, soul winners need to be tougher than the average Christian. Because whatever crack you have, God, Satan is going to try to drive wedges in those cracks. He's got to get you to stop. He can't take away your salvation. He can't make you go to hell. He can't do anything to stop the fact that you are saved, but he can knock you out of this Christian life. And look, I've seen a lot of people knocked out of the Christian life. And they knocked out of the Christian life for various reasons, but to, to them at that time, they're thinking, oh yeah, this is something I need to handle here. And they're knocked out of, they take themselves out of the Christian life. It's not of God. It's not of God. Look, hell is real, folks. This is not a plastic hell we're talking about. Hell is a real thing. And if these people don't get saved out here in Fresno in these neighborhoods and they die tomorrow, they're going to go there. It is an extremely serious thing, and Satan will try anything. You've got a target on your back if you're somebody that's out there giving the gospel. 
Running from God doesn't work. Not picking up the phone doesn't work. You're eternally saved, but you can be chastised every day on this earth. That's the lesson here in this first part of Jonah. Look, why not answer? Why not answer? Why not learn the Lord's will in your life? And then you know what? I mean, it's kind of like 1 Kings chapter 18 where Elijah says, you know, he's like, he's like, how long halt ye between two opinions? You know, when you, you just decide, you got to make a decision in your Christian life that you're just going to start learning what God wants for you, start picking up the phone, and then you're just going to go for it. You're not going to waver on things. You're like, oh, you know, look, everybody gets doubts about everything. It's normal. It's normal. It's the devil. Just blast through any resistance. This is why being unstable will ruin your life. This is why the Bible talks so much about, you know, doing the Word of God, not just hearing it, but doing it and being a stable person. Because that way when you hit that resistance, like, look, my life is pretty simple. You say, it doesn't seem like you have a simple life. My life is pretty simple. I literally do the same things every week. And sometimes I feel different about certain things, but I just keep doing the same things because I know what I'm supposed to do. And you just keep just blasting through any resistance. Just make a decision. You know, follow him. That's what, that's what he says. That's what he says in 1 Kings chapter 18. If the Lord be God, what is the next thing he says? Follow him. Just make a decision. If Baal, if Baal be God, follow him. But you all know that already, that Baal's God. The Lord be God. If this Bible is true, which you know, it's true. It's how you got saved. Follow it. Pick up the phone. Blast through any resistance. Look, it, it, it just answer calls in your life. Running from God does not work. And being part of this church, you are going to know what God wants for you. For sure, you are going to know. Especially by the time you get to be a soul winner and you're out there preaching the gospel, you're going to know the Bible better than 99.99% of people you run across. And you know that's true if you're a soul winner. Nobody knows anything about the Bible. But just listen and just decide you're going to follow it. Because running from God does not work. That's what we learned from Jonah in part one of this story. Let's bow our heads and have a word of, word of prayer.